is when a celebrity is the celebrity and they won't deviate from that and it's they're very protected of their brand they're not going to play along and they're the hero they become the hero and that's what you recall the, the brand is forgotten like no one recalls it welcome to episode 19 of the science of advertising show the show where we talk all things neuroscience advertising and effective communication the show where we disclose the advertising secrets that brands use to influence and persuade human behavior. And on today's show, we have Justin Oberman, founder of Oberman Partners and one of the leading brand response creative directors in the US of A. Justin, oh. welcome to the show. It's great to have you on again. Thanks. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be on again too. This is a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, well, this is the second time we've caught up and I really enjoyed the last episode because I know you're an avid student of the art and science of advertising, but more so an advertising historian, which you don't come across that often. So no, looking, yeah. looking forward to your wisdom as we work through today's show. We've got a big lineup. So today we've got a, a focus on celebrities. Should we use them in ads? If we do, how best do we leverage them? And more to the point, what are some fatal errors or mistakes brands make when using celebrities? So to kick it mm -hmm. off, we have some new work from Alexa in Australia. It features Sophie Monk. Let's cut to it now. Here's the latest from Alexa. Oh, Alexa, can you add Avon snacks and Bugs, Bickies, Mushies, Mozzie Spray, Palmy Pavs, Bob Rolls and Bubbles to my shopping list, please. Too easy. I have added to your shopping list. Thanks, Alexa. I'll see you when I'm looking at you. Hooroo. Love, there's so much to love about this creative. Um, Justin, being the advertising historian, are there any insights? Oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Advertising historian. Okay. Uh, first of all, um, I did not work on this campaign, uh, but I, I hung around a lot, uh, Euro, uh, in New York and stuff when it was uh, being owned by them. And uh, a couple of friends of mine were working on it. <clears throat> this is in the later years. Um, and uh, uh, definitely some of the lines that I've joked around with actually some of the spots, not in the one that, that, that we saw here, but um, uh, the history, okay. The history of this, this concept is beautiful, beautiful lesson. Uh, and it goes a little bit to what I was saying before about um, Ryan Reynolds approach to this, where he's like, I, I just, you can't, can't take this selling thing so seriously. A lot of what um, Paul Feldwick talks uh, you know, the world famous strategist, uh, you know, um, the anatomy of humbug, right. Um, and, um, of, of, of a little of showmanship, right. And, and this, and a sort of laid back attitude. So, um, Lieberman and, um, uh, Brandon, uh, Henderson, right. Were the, the creators, the team that came up with this, the, and the interesting thing is they, they've been working on the account for a while, but they were getting really tired of it. Uh, because they kept ideas and nothing was getting through. Um, and a new, a new um, a strategist, in, they call insight strategist, um, I forget her last name, uh, Caroline was her first name. She had the, she presented them with like a new insight, which was, and I wrote it down. Oh yes, she said, it said men are generally desperate, seen more interesting than they are. Um, and uh, Brandon and Carl, they, they felt like it was um, a little bit demeaning, a little bit, whatever. Uh, and so they uh, decided to, rather than answer the brief, to make fun of it. What was the world's most interesting? Uh, and that is the origin story of how the most interesting man was invented by making fun of the brief that they received. I think that is a beautiful Absolutely. lesson. Uh, I know strategists probably don't like to hear that, but um, <laughs> but uh, you know sometimes it's just and you know uh, and definitely um, uh, you know um, a lot of the things Paul Feldwick talks about in his books definitely 
leads to that that kind of uh, to that atmosphere. So that that's the history of of the campaign. Why it works, you know. First, I, I, I'd be very here. I'm actually curious to hear from you about why you think it works because on a an advertising level, and, and maybe this is the answer to why it works, which was making fun of the brief. On advertising, it, it breaks tons of rules. The client even says, I don't, like it's a beer commercial. And he says, I don't always drink beer, but when I do, you know, like the, your main spokesperson doesn't always drink beer. Like that's an interesting line to say, right? Um, also, you have a senior citizen, right? That uh, the the category, the target market here is men in their 20s, 30s, whatever. And the spokesperson, like, you know, the spokesperson, so Bud Budweiser used to use lizards and frogs, whatever. But at, at the time that, at the time that this ad was made, most beer commercials were, you know, people uh, on the beach and partying and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so here you have a senior citizen, right? As the spokesperson, of a beer brand selling to targeting 20s and 30 year olds, um, which at the time I was. Uh, so, um, you know, and, and, you know, plus a good portion of the commercial is not about the beer, it's about him. It's uh, talk, you know, you wanna to talk to me about a celebrity uh, taking over, you know, uh, distracting from the ad and, and, and stuff like that, of course, this person didn't become a celebrity. The actor didn't become a celebrity till later. The persona didn't, uh, you know, eventually became a celebrity. I, one thing I will say is that the casting here is also amazing, right? This is not skimpy casting. This is um, uh, uh, Will Lyman is the voiceover. And he's a very, very famous, uh, he's a very, very famous uh, voiceover actor. Uh, for commercials here uh, and movies in general, here in the in, in the states at least, um, and then uh, Jonathan uh, Gold, I think it's Goldsmith Goldblum. Gold, Gold, I think it's Jonathan Goldsmith is the actor who plays the world's most intriguing man. And then he they retired him. He retired him with an ad that sent him to the moon. Uh, and then they had a new guy come in and play him, but that only lasted like two years. Eventually, I think they retired this campaign in 20, 2018. Um, but interestingly enough, uh, ja, ja, the the character, which I don't understand from a legal perspective, but the world's most interesting man, as the world's most interesting man, um, has appeared after that uh, by Jonathan Goldsmith in a in a uh, Stella a tour, uh, Stella ad, um, and also in a in a teque- in, uh, several years ago, three years ago, in a tequila ad. Um, I don't know legally how that works, but um, <laughs> you know. A- but uh, but then it's also a meme, right? Uh, it's the perfect formula for a meme. Um, and just like the ads, just like where's the beef uh, from last week, uh, in which when we were talking about where's the beef, I also brought up, I can't believe I ate the whole thing and try to like it. Um, and always a bridesmaid's always a bride from, you know, print ads from Listerine. Um, the, his, I, 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 the structure of what he's saying um, has become a slogan, which is interesting in and of itself. And then, which stay thirsty, my friends, which is like kind of like the line that was hoping to be that, you know, didn't. Uh, it's still somewhat known, but uh, no one goes around saying that. Um, so, one thing, and then I'll leave it over to you to hear what your analysis of this is, because I'm really curious, because I, like I said, it broke all the rules. But the one rule that I see that, that I notice here, is that it um, it uses this catchphrase. So maybe there's, there's something to catchphrases that we're missing uh, in, in a lot of advertising these, day, these days, the, uh, you know, uh, um, th- because they're extremely memorable, at least for the long term. But now I hand it off to you. I'm- well, they are. And, and as soon as you get a catchphrase that gets into vernacular, you win, it, just as long as you can actually keep brand to it. But, um, <laughs> there's three, three key points here that I, I want to cover mentioned was, you know, about understanding the market on, and I see far too many brands jumping 
the idea without really understanding what the idea or what basis for the idea should be, or if it bears a few ideas. And there's several brands we're working with in Australia right now that are absolutely flying and all, you know, and that's what, that's the foundation from where all good advertising should come from. You know, research should be a fundamental part of the process of creating any assets rather than just jumping to the fun, sexy part of, you know, spending a lot of money and, you know, creating something that, that you want to create. The second, this really plays, you know, we've got three brains. We've got, we've got a reptilian brain, a mammalian brain, and we've got a neocortex. And this really taps into the mammalian, which is our herd animal. Oh yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah. So we're looking at a herd animal here and we're looking at the most interesting man in the world. And if we're looking at creating an ad that's talking to young males in particular, or young men, do you know, what do they want? You know, they want to live a life that, you know, is interesting. It's bold. It's daring. Do you know, they want to get to their 50s, 60s, 70s and, and be this guy that have, you know, the blood that smells like cologne, it really taps into masculinity as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so what, advertising is you also buy an identity mm -hmm. when you buy a brand so when you buy this beer and you hold it up you're buying the identity of this individual of the most interesting man in the world so that mm -hmm. when someone else sees it they're like oh i see what you're doing do you know that's especially when it comes to alcoholic beverages it's all about buying an identity so they bought an identity here and they've wrapped it up in what i believe is like a great mini story like you've seen this guy's life and what he's done and some challenges and like the bear scene stands out to me as he opens up the bear trap. Do you know, he's not afraid. He has no fear. This is the identity that you want to buy. So that's the character. And the reason I've thrown this one in the end, because there is no celebrity. They've created like, their own character, which they own. And there's no misconception around the character is the brand. You cannot get that wrong. Right. I mean, this is like this David Ogilvy playbook with the man in the Hathaway shirt, the Schweppes guy, um, you know, uh, flow from progressive. Um, uh, uh, to a certain extent, uh, the old spice guy. So, yeah. So when you create your own character, you have a long term branded asset that mistaken for any other brand. You own it. Celebrity, on the other hand, could go to any brand. You, you don't have control over them and worse still if their brand equity increases you've just got to pay a hell of a lot more um so this is why i love creating your own characters v paying overs trying to leverage the attributes you're trying to harvest from or or from a, a celebrity so this is this has all the good stuff in it so that like great story it's the identity that you're buying into and if you're looking to the the frame of it the first line the first line has you you know 80 cents in the dollar is spent in the first three to four seconds mm -hmm. police often mm -hmm. question him as they often find him interesting you're like oh wow you know, so his police just want to arrest him to find out more about him. Do you know? And it just goes through. So, I, like, I, I love everything about it. Um, from a performance perspective, I know sales increased by 20 over 20. Got to compare the pair. So, these are two ads in the booming online betting world that has gone nuts in COVID. So, these, to give it context, Justin, these are two mid sized brands. And they're really trying to take on the giant. And the giant over here is Sportsbet. So let's have a look at these two brands. So we've got Pointsbet and Bet365. Let's cut to them now. Here's Pointsbet and Bet365. Paige, keep your head down. Yes, Paige. Feet shoulder width. That's your best bet. Did you say bet? Mm -hmm. Now just grip it and rip it. Magnificent. A 350-yard bomb. And I went even longer on the Tigers tonight. Where did it land? It hasn't. Four! You should see when I use two hands. It's shacking easy to bet anytime, anywhere with the points bet app. When Bet365 was created, perfect condition. we had a simple vision. We wanted to connect people to every game that matters. We wanted to build the ultimate sports app. So we did. Download the app and see for yourself. Why bet 365? 
is the world's favorite online betting company. Gamble responsibly. So there we have it. Points bet. I'll start there. So this is Shaquille O'Neal, obviously, in the creative. He is the hero. They've moved away. They used to have Allen Iverson, so NBA player. And then we go on Shaq, both an NBA player, both US NBA, NBA players. So I think Shaq's a much better choice than Allen because he's instantly recognizable. Whereas Allen, you really need to know the game to, to really understand where he fits in the in the mix and then we've got bet 365 um so for those of you who couldn't pick it it was anthony lapalia so he's an australian he's been featured in several tv series he actually was a goalkeeper for sydney fc back in the 80s so he's he's got quite a heritage with soccer he actually was part owner of sydney football club several years ago in, in the mid 2000s but it was really subtle. And if I was to break them down, I don't think either of them are cracking commercials and have hit it out the park using celebrity by any stretch of the imagination. But Bet365, what I liked about it is it did get attention. You had your mini soccer players, you had mini commentators, mini AFL players, basketball players running around in the real world. You know, it's different. I hadn't seen it before. It kind of kept and held my attention. What I didn't like about it, that could have been any brand. There was nothing unique about Bet365. The promise they had in it was it's the ultimate sports app. It had no proof. What what makes it the ultimate sports app? Why would I want to use it? You know, it was really the idea about having mini players running around the real world and trying to integrate that to uh, Bet365. Anthony was really subtle. It was his voice. You know, they probably paid a reasonable sum for him, but it could have been anyone. And unless you really were a soccer nerd, you wouldn't have picked up that there was any connection to him to the soccer world at all. So I, I think that that's definitely comes in second place points bet. I'll go to you, Justin. What did no, you No, 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 go on. No, go on, go on, go on points bet. I like what they're trying to do to create a term or vernacular being it's shack and easy, which you just go, okay, it's shack and easy. It's shack, shack and easy and trying to connect that to points bet. So there's, there is some, you know, encoding of memory that's going on. That's what I believe they're trying to do. But like, again, it's an interesting ad, you know, he hits it out of the park, but you, you don't recall points, but again, it could have been any brand. There's no strong connection. The betting world, I firmly believe is really driven by offers and promotions. And you see this, they've kind of got their brand ad, which this is. And then when they dovetail it with specific offers, like bonus bets or, you know, if your team's up by half time, we'll pay out your bet. That's what punters transfer from one app to the other because it's about increasing their odds of winning money. Mm. Both of these ads to brand ads, you know, again, I don't think they're particularly strong, but if I was to pick a winner, I'd be points bet. Really? Yeah. Okay. Go. Be the contrarian. Uh, <laughs> I'll be the contrarian. It's funny that you picked uh, that, that this is, there's an ad here with Shaq because you know, uh, I'm, I'm tasked with uh, doing a future episode and uh, one of the other ads I, uh, I'm looking at has Shaq in it as well, which made me actually kind of look at an article about Shaq and why he's appearing in commercials lately. And he's actually considered one of the uh, most successful business people coming out of sports next to George Foreman. Um, and he had his, his investing philosophy is fun. Like, uh, he only wants to invest in companies that that make the world a, a funner place to be in. And uh, I'm not going to spoil the, the one that I was looking at, but um, in, in this case, for points bet, look, in, in, in both of these things, points bet and bet 365, the, the name is telling me what the app is. And I imagine that if I'm a sports person or betting per gambling person that 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 i that i know what they are but the i felt like the points bet ad only talked about the product for like i think like eight seconds or so like it was all about like shack swinging a golf club with the, so the celebrity uh australian uh, uh, golf person and you know the stereotype shack you know when he hits a golf ball it just keeps going and going and going and going and going and going i got wrapped up in all of that and so that that moment of time because that he uses in order to talk about the product i kind of lost that you know again 
the name of the brand is in is in the the you know says what the product does so it's a little bit helpful but i thought the ad again was more about shack than it was about the product and i would imagine I, my i don't i don't I don't know if, you know, like starch ratings and, you know, uh, I imagine that if you asked most people who saw that ad once, what was the product? They might not remember. Wouldn't for either of them be. Yeah. I, right. Right. I yeah. I, I think they would remember Shaq. Um, oh, 100% don't. Right. Yeah, I agree. Um, and I, I think that the other one ha- has in a way the same problem. They don't mention the product till the end. I thought it was a little bit, uh, of a better ad in the voice over and the copy was getting closer to explaining something. Unfortunately, I didn't even feel like it explained anything. I think like they had the terms, like it's the, you know, uh, our, we built three, that's 365. Okay, so it's a betting app, maybe, I don't know. We built, uh, in order to connect every, uh, to connect every sports person to, to every game that matters. It's not an association I make with a betting app, like connect. What do you mean connecting me to like, like connecting me to every game? Like there's a little bit, you're getting a little too emotional here for what the product is. And then also like it's, you know, so we built the ultimate sports app. You're not a sports app, you're a betting app, like wrong category to me, right? Like I, you're, you're a betting app for sports, but it's not, you're not explaining the product to me, right? I, I felt like none of these ads really were based on any kind of idea that that came from an insight of the way people use betting apps. If this if that makes any sense, you know what I mean? Like it, I, it didn't. Yeah, I, I completely, so, I completely agree. Yeah, yeah, and so that's why if I were to if I had to, I choose none of them, but if I had to choose one, I was going to go with the the bet 365 only because I also got the weird sense too, that this guy, the celebrity that they use wasn't so well known. He also, even if he was well known, he's not, he's not coming across that way. He's coming across kind of laid back and he's not as distracting. It's just his voice. And then he appears a couple of times and, um, and there is somewhat of a character development with it with him there, like he could, you know, but not. And the copy came the closest to at least, at least they tried to describe what their app, what this this product was, which I thought was, you know, somewhat helpful. But I just want to say something about both of them in this case, particularly the Shaq one, right? Is whenever people talk to me about celebrities, and I think I mentioned this to you one before, there's this really old, David Ogilvy clip where David Ogilvy Mm -hmm. actually appeared on Letterman and to peddle his new book uh, on advertising or yeah, right. That's what it's called Ogilvy on advertising and Letterman's asking him a bunch of questions. And interestingly enough, in, in that interview, he talks about the uh, eye patch for guy for Hathaway shirts. Right. And he talks about the Schweppes guy. Right. And Letterman is almost smart enough to take that cue and be like, so you've created a lot of interesting characters, um, but what about using celebrities? And then Ogilvy says, I used to do it. I don't anymore. And his thing and his reasons are they cost too much money for the ROI. They they uh, they they're hard to work with and they they distract from the product. And interestingly enough, the example that he gives is he did a commercial for, and I guess the point of it is I can't remember the name of the brand, but also because the brand didn't make it for a margarine. Mm, Good luck margarine, I think it was. A good luck margarine, yeah. Using Eleanor Roosevelt. I don't know if you want to show this clip. It might be worth showing. Let's do it. All right, let's cut to the clip now. Let's show good luck margarine. Years ago, most people never dreamed of eating margarine, but times have changed nowadays. You can get a margarine like the new Good Luck, which really tastes delicious. That's what I've spread on my toast. Good luck. I thoroughly enjoy it. The margarine Mrs. Roosevelt has just recommended is new Good Luck, the light margarine. Good Luck is light in flavor, light on your tongue, and leaves no oily aftertaste. Well, there you have. That's what we were talking about, yeah. Justin. Good Luck margarine. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, uh, Ogilvy is quick to point out you know, there, you know, first of all, it was politically divisive, but second of all, p- 
people remembered Eleanor Roosevelt, no one could remember the Margaret. And so he, he made that a point that he doesn't use celebrities anymore. Now, I don't think he's, you know, uh, in this business, we like to use these uh, absolute sentences all the time. You know, obviously the Alexa ads that I mentioned before that use Michael P. Jordan and and uh, that used uh, Gordon Ramsay, Anthony Hopkins, you know, mm-hmm. like as the voices, uh, you know, like, like those were good uses of celebrities, again, because the celebrity is being turned into a character, it's turning to the product, and it, it's a, the, the, the big thing is the idea, and then the celebrity is just sort of playing the role in an idea, right? The way that like a really bad movie, a celebrity could distract from a really bad movie. It's like, it's almost like if you know that this is Brad Pitt, like you're watching Brad Pitt in this movie, and the whole time you're aware that this is Brad Pitt, it's probably a bad movie. But when you're watching Fight Club, and like you, it's it's Tyler Durden. It's not Brad Pitt. Then it's a good movie. So I think the same thing applies to 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 a commercial. Celebrity is the hero. All it does is increase their equity in their own brand. And this is what we kind of see time and time again. And this is one of the fatal errors that that we come across is when a celebrity is the celebrity. And they won't deviate from that. And it's, they're very protected of their brand. They're not going to play along and they're the hero. They become the hero. And that's what you recall. The, the brand is forgotten. Like no one recalls it. It's, it's really interesting. Um, one of our first episodes we actually had, it was during lockdown and L'Oreal put out this ad for, with Eva Longoria and it was her dyeing her own hair. You know, look at all my grays and it was shot on I think it was iPhone cameras and, and it was really interesting. And that clip, got circulated around because we could see it on our LinkedIn through all through Europe, through L'Oreal. And we were quite harsh on it because Eva Longoria was very firm on her. Like you could see, she wasn't really mentioning L'Oreal. She was talking about her grays in her story and the branding on it was really poor. I think that they mentioned L'Oreal once in it. And there was very, there was little to no branding throughout the whole thing, except the end frame. And that's, that was our narrative. And then after it started getting bounced around and all the rest of it, and I got a little bit nervous going, what's going on here? Because the head of Europe, L'Oreal, looked at my LinkedIn profile at least a dozen times. <laughs> Next thing we noticed, the ad came out in a different variation and it was far better branded. It actually had L'Oreal on screen throughout the entire creative. Like it actually took up a few of these recommendations and whether that's sheer coincidence or not. But it was really interesting because she was really the hero of that ad. And you just go, oh, Eva's got grays. That's interesting. And she dyes her hair at home during lockdown. Like that's what you remember from it. You don't remember or L'Oreal's not anchored to it. And I, this is the key to getting it right with a celebrity. Cause when you get it right, it flies. When you get it wrong, which is the majority of the time it tanks and it's very, very expensive. And this is why you see a lot of big, big brands, especially Super Bowl, that leverage celebrity. Oh, that's the last Super Bowl is just awful. It was like, like an ad for Hollywood. <laughs> it was it is. just awful. But but you don't get attention in that environment anyway because everyone's running the same strategy. Like it's, it's right. how can we do it? So this is where the product has to be the hero. And if you are leveraging celebrity, where we also see it well, like Ryan Reynolds, if you don't know Ryan Reynolds, it still works. Yeah, yeah, I guess, yeah. Yeah, if you do know him, it, it's it's. 10 times or a hundred times more effective because he's got this instantly recognizable face that you trust and you want to be a bit like him somewhere deep down because he, right. he has that status. He's got star power, but you go like even George Clooney, Nespresso, it works because it's really integrated to his character, but Nespresso right. holding up the, the little you know cup with Nespresso branded on it. That's what I remember. Right. You know, it works because it fits his character, but Nespresso is the hero. Right. Right. And you want to leverage, and this is where you go, the right celebrity and going back to Nike and their formula is like, what traits do we want to leverage? So we can take their traits and associate them to our brand or product. Exactly. You know, that's the, that's why you want to use a celebrity and you want to get leverage. And if a celebrity is not prepared to leverage their brand and move it towards the brand and have the brand as the hero, it's not right. Right. Which is why... You know, I, you know, Shaq is trying, I, I, I would guess that Shaq is probably an investor in points bet. Uh, he seems to be in, I, I, I don't know that he seems to get involved in the commercials too, when he, when he does it, which is why it, it was that ad had the most potential, but I, I still feel like it, 
it didn't do a good job. Yeah, I, I, the only reason, so I'll have a caveat here. If it's just on the ad, which it should be, so I've kind of cheated here a little bit. Yeah. What I like about what they're doing with PointsBet is they have a platform now. So they have a platform that Shaq could appear in dozens of different ads in these scenarios, but they could also throw an offer on the back end of it. So it could be 20 seconds of Shaq 10 seconds of an offer if you're watching AFL. If your team's winning by halftime, we'll pay up the bet. And that is where you acquire new customers from that, that, the yeah. offer. Whereas if you yeah. look at a bet 365, that's a one ad in Solus. That's all it's really ever going to be because the production value on that would be reasonably expensive as well. Do you know, like this is where I go for a platform, for a brand and have longevity, points bet but- easily wins. But maybe they should take your advice, like you said, for where's the beef and, you know, say the, say the, say the slogan a bit, a few more times. And also uh, the name of the brand at least three times, you know, like a little, just a little bit more, because I, I, I don't think that everyone that's into sports is into betting. I like sports, but I'm not into sports betting, you know? And so they still have to sell. They, They need to sell, you know, their product. And, um, Right now, they're just selling Shaq. Let's get into our classic creative. Uh, so really famous ad. I absolutely love this. Uh, I'm just going to go straight to it. I'm not even going to throw to it. And let's see who recalls this one. The police often question him just because they find him interesting. His beard alone has experienced more than a lesser man's entire body. <laughs> His blood smells like cologne. He is the most interesting man in the world. I don't always drink beer, but when I do, I prefer Dos Equis. Stay thirsty, my friends. I love, there's so much to love about this creative. Um, Justin, being the advertising historian, are there any insights? Oh, here we go. (laughs) (laughs) Wonderful. The advertising historian. Yes. What do we need to know about this creative? First of all, um, I did not work on this campaign, but I I hung around a lot, uh, Euro uh, in New York and stuff when it was being owned by them. And uh, a couple of friends of mine were working on it in the later years. Um, And uh, unofficially, uh, definitely some of the lines that I've joked around with actually ended up appearing uh, in some of the spots, not in the one that 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 we saw here, but um, the history of this this concept is beautiful. It is a beautiful lesson, uh, and it goes a little bit to what I was saying before about um, Ryan Reynolds' approach to this, where he's like, ah, it's, "You can't can't take this selling thing so seriously, right?" And a lot of what um, Paul Feldwick talks about in his in his books, you know, the world famous strategist. Uh, you know, um, the anatomy of humbug, right? Um, and why does the peddler sing? A little of showmanship, right? And and, this, and a sort of laid back attitude. So um, Carl Lieberman and um, uh, Brandon uh, Henderson, right? Were the, the creators, the team that came up with this. The, and the interesting thing is they, they've been working on the account for a while, but they were getting really tired of it uh, because they kept selling, coming up with ideas and nothing was getting through. Um, and a new strategist, in, they call insight strategist, um, I forget her last name, uh, Caroline was her first name. She had the, she presented them with like a new insight, which was, and I wrote it down. Oh yes, she said, it said men in their 20s are generally desperate to be seen more interesting than they are. And uh, Brandon and Carl, they, they felt like it was um, a little bit demeaning, a little bit insulting, a little bit. And... So they decided to, rather than answer the brief, to make fun of it. And the result was the world's most interesting man. And that is the origin story of how the uh, world's most interesting man was invented by making fun of the brief that they received. I think that is a beautiful lesson. Uh, I know you as a strategist probably don't like to hear that. You know, sometimes it's just, it just happens that way. Um, and, you know, uh, and definitely, um, uh, you know, um, a lot of the things Paul Feldwick talks about in his books, definitely 
leads to that that kind of uh, to that atmosphere. So that that's the history of of the campaign. Why it works, you know. First, I, I I'd be very here. I'm actually curious to hear from you about why you think it works because on a an advertising level, and and maybe this is the answer to why it works, which was making fun of the brief. On advertising, it it breaks tons of rules. I mean, the client even says, I don't, like it's a beer commercial. And he says, I don't always drink beer, but when I do, you know, like your main spokesperson doesn't always drink beer. Like that's an interesting line to say, right? And also you have a senior citizen, right? That uh, the, the category, the target market here is men in their 20s, 30s, whatever. And the spokesperson, like, you know, the spokesperson, so Bud, Budweiser used to use lizards and frogs, whatever. But at, at the time that, at the time that this ad was made, most beer commercials were, you know, people uh, on the beach and partying and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so here you have a senior citizen, right, as the spokesperson of a beer brand selling to targeting 20s and 30 year olds. Um, which at the time I was, you know, plus a good portion of the commercial is not about the beer. It's about him. It's uh, talk, you know, you want to talk to me about a celebrity taking over, you know, uh, distracting from the ad and, and, and stuff like that. Of course, this person didn't become a celebrity. The actor didn't become a celebrity till later. The persona didn't, uh, you know, eventually became a celebrity. I, one thing I will say is that the casting here is also amazing, right? This is not skimpy casting. This is Will Lyman is the voiceover. And he's a very, very famous, he's a very, very famous uh, voiceover actor uh, for commercials here uh, and movies in general here in the, in, in the States at least. Um, and then uh, Jonathan uh, Gold, I think it's Goldsmith, Goldblum, Gold, I think it's Jonathan Goldsmith is the actor who plays the world's most extreme man. And then he, they retired him. He retired him with an ad that sent him to the moon. Uh, and then they had a new guy come in and play him. But that only lasted like two years. Eventually, I think they retired this campaign in 20, 2018. But interestingly enough, the character, which I don't understand from a legal perspective, but the world's most interesting man as the world's most interesting man um, has appeared after that uh, by Jonathan Goldsmith in a in a uh, Stella a tour, uh, Stella ad, um, and also in a in a teque- in, uh, several years ago, three years ago in a tequila ad. I don't know legally how that works, but um, <laughs> you know, a- but uh, but then it's also a meme, right? It's the perfect formula for a meme, and just like the ads, just like where's the beef from last week. Uh, and which when we were talking about where's the beef, I also brought up, I can't believe I ate the whole thing and try it or like it. And always a bridesmaid's always a bride from, you know, print ads from Listerine. The structure of what he's saying um, has become a slogan, which is interesting in and of itself. And then which stay thirsty, my friends, which is like kind of like the line that was hoping to be that, you know, didn't. Uh, it's still somewhat known, but uh, no one goes around saying that. Um, so one thing and then I'll leave it over to you to hear what your analysis of this is, because I'm really curious, because I, like I said, it broke all the rules. But the one rule that I see that, that I notice here is that it uses this catchphrase. So maybe that there's something to catchphrases that we're missing uh, in, in a lot of advertising these, day, these days, the, uh, you know, uh, um, because they're extremely memorable at least for the long term. But now I hand it off to you. I'm- well, they are. And, and as soon as you get a catchphrase that gets into vernacular, you win. It, just as long as you can actually brand to it. I love that. There's three three key points here that I, I want to cover off. One that you mentioned was this ad was based on research. Do you know about understanding the market and what is actually going on? And I see far too many brands jump into wanting the idea without really understanding what the idea or what basis for the idea should be, or if at best it's just a couple of them knocking around a few, few ideas. And there's several brands we're working with in Australia right now that are absolutely flying. And all of the ideas have come from research. 
Do you know, and that's what that's the foundation from where all good advertising should come from. You know, research should be a fundamental part of the process of creating any assets rather than just jumping to the fun, sexy part of, you know, spending a lot of money and, you know, creating something that, that you want to create. The second, this really plays, you know, we've got three brains. We've got, we've got a reptilian brain, a mammalian brain, we've got a neocortex. And this really taps into the mammalian, which is our herd animal. Oh yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah. So we're looking at a herd animal here and we're looking at the most interesting man in the world. And if we're looking at creating an ad that's talking to young males in particular or young men, do you know, what do they want? You know, they want to live a life that, you know, is interesting. It's bold. It's daring. Do you know, they want to get to their 50s, 60s, 70s and, and be this guy that have, you know, the world's strongest beard, blood that smells like cologne. It really taps into masculinity as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. You know, so what, advertising is you also buy an identity mm -hmm. when you buy a brand so when you buy this beer and you hold it up you're buying the identity of this individual of the most interesting man in the world so that mm -hmm. when someone else sees it they're like oh i see what you're doing do you know that's especially when it comes to alcoholic beverages it's all about buying an identity so they bought an identity here and they've wrapped it up in what i believe is like a great mini story like you've seen this guy's life and what he's done and some challenges and like the bear scene stands out to me as he opens up the bear trap, you know, he's not afraid. He has no fear. This is the identity that you want to buy. So that's the character. And the reason I've thrown this one in the end, because there is no celebrity. They've created right. their own character, which they own. And there's no misconception around the character is the brand. You cannot get that wrong. Right. I mean, this is like this David Ogilvy playbook with the man in the Hathaway shirt, the Schweppes guy, Flo from Progressive, to a certain extent, uh, the Old Spice guy, right? So, yeah. So when you create your own character, you have a long-term branded asset that cannot be mistaken for any other brand. You own it. Celebrity, on the other hand, could go to any brand. You, you don't have control over them and worse still if their brand equity increases you've just got to pay a hell of a lot more so this is why i love creating your own characters v paying overs trying to leverage the attributes you're trying to harvest from or or from a, a celebrity so this is this has all the good stuff in it so that like the framework of is it is a great story it's the identity that you're buying into and if you're looking to the the frame of it the first line the first line has you, you know, 80 cents in the dollar is spent in the first three to four seconds. Mm -hmm. Police often mm -hmm. question him as they often find him interesting. You're like, oh, wow. You know, mm -hmm. so he's got this real level of intrigue. Who is this guy? The police just want to arrest him to find out more about <laughs> him. Do you know? And it just goes through. So I, like, I, I love everything about it from a performance perspective. I know sales increased by 20, over 22% in a really short amount of time. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the fastest growing beer brands at, at that particular time. So this absolutely hit it out of the park and, and you know, created the foundation for the brand that is today. But um, an interesting comparison too, because you're the whole mammalian brain and herd brand thing. So in, in Eugene Schwartz's uh, access of, of how to, when to create a good ad or, you know, the, the formula, you know, where he says uh, product awareness and brand sophistication. So when you get into a brand sophistication model, or when you get to a point where the advertising is just completely um, saturated, where the, the, the benefit to product is all used up when the mechanism to benefit the product, you know, when that game has changed, you know, so it's like you know, the first cigarettes ads, all they had to say was it's tasty, right? Then eventually it went from I'm tasty, then they, they, everyone's saying how flavorful it is. So then, you know, another brand comes along and says it's toasted. That's why it's tasty. Ah, so they go from the mechanism, then everyone else starts doing that. So then what do you do when everyone is saying the same thing and you can't talk about your product because no one cares? You can't talk about the, the desire for your product because everyone else is saying the same thing. And you can't even talk about the need for, because everyone else is saying that the only thing you have left is your mammalian brain is the herd. The only thing you have left is your market 
and the identity of your market. And so like in the famous example that Eugene Schwartz talks about, he talks, he says, so in comes Marlboro and the Marlboro man, right? Just a picture of a cowboy smoking a cigarette and he has tattoos, which at the time <laughs> was not a normal thing, you know, and they, they completely disrupted the market, right? In, in that sense, I think that this is also a, a test case of probably the same thing is going on here. It's it's a hundred percent, and especially yeah. if you're looking at younger individuals, they're desperate. They're, they're still trying to figure out what is their identity, yeah. you know. And the way that they create their own identity is take bits of everyone else's to create their own. Okay. And, and especially young men, one of the the traits they'll that'll never go away because it's closely linked to you know testosterone is masculinity. There's always going to be a market that wants to be masculine and appear masculine. You know, you got the male, like it's very easy if you create that masculine image, but probably now in today's society, it's a little bit more challenging because <laughs> of everything that's going on and it's masculinity is deemed as, or yeah, <laughs> yeah, it depends. So, yeah. So look, yeah, it, it's very much the identity that they've created that you buy into for this, that it wins. And, and if you look at FMCG, that's what a lot of FMCG is. Um, it's, it's buying the identity. The one thing I did want to loop back on was, several other brands using the most interesting man in the world. So it sounds like they don't have any trademark or copyright over that particular entity, which is interesting. And do you know, you know, the Energizer bunny? Yeah, of course. Do you know that used to be the Duracell bunny? No. Wow. Well, you stumped me. I'm the, wow. I'm the history guy. I did not know that. I'm going to look that up. I don't believe you. So yeah, it used to be the <laughs> Duracell bunny and the the rumor has it that Duracell actually lapsed their IP wow. and Energizer took it and ran with it. Wow. So I'll just make that. sure that you're looking at your long-term branded assets and legally you have them wrapped up nice oh, and tight so no one there, can can live. There are room for lawyers in your world. Uh, in our <laughs> world. I, okay. Yeah, definitely. Well, again, like if, if they had wrapped up the most interesting man in the world, no one else would be able to use it. And uh, yeah, Justin, yes. thank you for your time. No problem. Very good episode. I've got to go home to Alexa and try a few <laughs> things now. And <laughs> we all want to see, <laughs> see how, see how she responds, but mate, thank you for your time no and problem. your insights. It's very valued. And I'm sure everyone listening has enjoyed hearing your wisdom and insights. All right. Thanks. Till next time. And Thanks, Justin. Till next time. You got it.